if you were flipping through vinyl albums back in the heavy metal section and you're flipping through and flipping through and then you see the 60 foot tall forearm demon dude with abs of steel he's red he has a big axe crazy grill up in the teeth area this force of nature that's coming to like wipe all things away and then he shoots those big spiky rocks up through the ground he's not concerned we are not a problem for him like, i've never heard of this band but this looks awesome <laughs> Choosing where we go next is something that Matt and I spend a lot of time on. And we try to settle on a word or a mood or a feel for the next year's story. So when we decided we wanted to go back to Oblivion, we knew right away that Dagon had to be a part of it because he was such a huge part in Task 4. It's as much about how he's trying to recruit allies in Blackwood as it is about anything else because he needs the help. And so that brings in kind of the political and cultural conflicts that Elder Scrolls is known for. We create what we call a style guide, and that style guide includes the themes of the zone. And for uh, both Blackwood and the Deadlands, Mayrun's Dagon was certainly in the forefront and the background of almost everything we did. Mayrun's Dagon is the Prince of Destruction, the Prince of Change. All those words mean something very specific to him but he's a bit of an enigma, I think, to anybody else. You're always looking at you know, the themes of what a prince represents, their ultimate goals, how they're gonna achieve it, and then how is that affecting the everyday life of the people? What is the culture like in the area? What happens when those two collide? That's always really important, and I think that's something that makes a antagonist story really compelling. Even if he's not present, you feel touches of his influence everywhere because everything that happens is kind of a result of him. I don't think that he does what he does because he's mean or because he's evil. He does what he does because that's what he is. Destruction is just a part of reality, right? Like, nothing lasts forever. And when you're the prince of destruction, you're kind of the prince of everything in that sense, right? Like, you have sway over a part of everything. I had done Dragonhold as a DLC before, but we did that entirely in the office. I knew this chapter, it's a lot bigger, there's a lot more to do in general. And then I was like, oh man, we're gonna do this from home. How are we gonna do this? Everybody was learning on the fly how to collaborate remotely, so there was a lot of meetings with like <laughs> muted mics and, and whatnot. This gets that kind of like height thing that you were talking about, CJ. Yeah. Look up, look up, look up, look up. See, there you go. Does. What's the point? Yeah. <laughs> this year was 100% completely at home. How do we be collaborative in an environment that is really not suited to be collaborative? In a studio this size, and we're talking hundreds of people all connected in a connected environment, IT is kind of the lifeblood that makes all of that work. If you can imagine something you really hate in front of you, just, yeah, and just play with that. It was kind of like glory and chaos at the same time. Everything's like a new frontier and just every moment is a new issue. Oh, you get the light go off. <laughs> it was enough to maintain all these things here. Now I need to maintain them at their homes. In truth, in the end, a lot of these folks are gamers. They kind of reconcile that like they know what they're doing. Bringing Dagon to life literally takes a village. It is a huge undertaking to coordinate all the different groups that are responsible for putting this together. I'm there kind of to help guide and give them a, a map to go off of uh, as far as story and location, stuff like that. And it's up to the designers and the writers and encounters and art and everyone else who works on these things uh, to kind of take that and run with it. When we start any character, we have to do research and we have to figure out how is this character going to work. I had my 14-year-old take pictures of me and I had like, <laughs> I had my five-year-old's like toy weapons <laughs> and I would like hold them like I would think they I would hold them and I would do a couple different poses and then I would take them into Photoshop and draw over them and put them together so <laughs> it would be like sets of poses together with forearms. The concepts tend to be in 2D. It's up to us as the character artist to go in and, and add all the extra heavy detail. We spent a lot of time researching and learning anatomy. So we're able to take that anatomical knowledge and, and try to come up with an idea of how it would actually work. 
Anatomy of where and how those arms are connected was a big part of what the experimentation kind of exploration was. We had to check punching, we had to check hitting, all the things that you would expect from Dagon. I'll take a character and I always like to put them in the zone that they're going to be so that way I can make sure the lighting is perfect, the textures look good in that environment. How do you art direct around such a distinct and universally red palette, right? Like, what are we going to put into there to make it worth walking around in and interesting and, and give the content guys something to play with? There was one particular page, I believe, from Dagon's book that has a red triangle and other symbols on it. And I just, I sat down and I drew from that page for an afternoon. These are symbols that are directly from Dagon, right? I wanted to try to infuse that into the rest of the designs as much as I possibly could. The horns, the horn-like shapes, all of that molds into the architecture. It all folds into what we're trying to do with the rocks and the environment and the biome. The Deadlands is a, a physical manifestation of his will and his, you know, his values. For every rune or magic circle that we have that has Daedric writing on it, there's some tension behind all those, all those things. I see that and suddenly I have more story ideas because like now I've got this space and I can see like the setting of things in this space and it inspires me, then change some of the story beats. As the quest started coming in and the level design came in, the story had to shift. I remember working really closely with Michelle on it and you write and you play it and you get feedback and you edit and you play it and you get feedback and you edit and you play it, but that's, that's the fun part because it's, you're just kind of whittling away at something until it's perfect. When you work with something that people know and love, it's a little intimidating, right? Like you can't screw up Mayroon's Dagon. Early on, talked to the encounter designer that I was gonna be working with and I was like, you know, I don't really know what's going on for your like idea for this fight or what your team is planning for it. So he said, oh, well, we're gonna have a you know, 300 foot Dagon that the player goes toe to toe with. And I thought he was joking. I was like, ha, huh, like that's a funny, funny joke. Having the entire year story culminate in a fight with a Daedric Prince is, is kind of the dream when you're working on an Elder Scrolls game. <laughs> he can be the evil. He can be the big bad. He can be somebody that you look at and you go, I don't want to be in league with him. Now that doesn't stop some people from wanting to be in league with him. He really sets the tone of everything that you fight, right? Because they're his minions, so they abide by his rules, they serve him. A lot of the monsters that we worked on ended up getting that sort of treatment. We call it the Dagon treatment. It greatly impacted the Ruinach. He is created to be the embodiment of Meirun's Dagon, the voice and the sword of Meirun's Dagon. So that directly influenced all of their abilities and stuff. And they have whirlwind abilities that they, they spin around in place and destroy things. We wanted something beastly and something threatening and something that would feel like a real fight. Chaotic, hectic, scary nature that is Meirun's Dagon. And we embody that uh, in some pretty brutal ways. <laughs> because he, as a character says, as like, an entity is so big, we had to decide when to um, present him at meaningful moments to the player and um, how those moments are going to impact the overall story. All of our scenes that have been crafted around his appearance either show him breaking something or being just generally menacing to the people around him. He's not a slow character, but he's just a really large, deliberate individual, and we have to carry him that way through all the experiences. They have this huge weight. Um, they're working against gravity. And then you have to figure out a way to represent that in sound. I'll do like a 10 second long arm swipe or something, like something really simple. You have to make that impact and then put all the detail in this like 10 second long tail. And that is actually what gives it the size, more so than the loudness or anything. It's all the detail in these long sounds. And when he talks, he doesn't talk really fast like that. He talks like that. Mortals. 
<laughs> Lehman and I and Becky were talking about how do we make Dagon different from the other princes? We wanted to do an accent that was unexpected. Can they flee, withstand the rushing waters of a deluge? Can a sapling fend off the flames of a raging wildfire? <laughs> no. Dagon's voice should sound deep and powerful, kind of like a volcano that's on the verge of erupting. And Dagon is so huge that we don't want him shouting. He, he basically fills up the sky. And so sort of physically, I always think of like, so like this channel in the back of my neck where that sort of like, that sort of like, whatever that sound is, that that's sort of a part of him. It's always kind of boiling around his voice, like a storm, you know, like that's constantly swirling around him. And so then whatever comes out sort of comes out all in the focused energy like that. His presence, his personality, his desires, it's so, I mean, it's literally world consuming. So you don't often get to play somebody with that kind of vision and with that kind of potential. He has to be all empowering and he really doesn't think that you're anything for him to worry about, but also, you know, he has to, he has to sound a little scary because he's big. <laughs> The guy doesn't exist really until he's got a voice and sounds and everything, and then he's like a real presence. Run, little maggots. Flee from the god of destruction. <laughs> Typically when I'm writing the Elder Scrolls orchestra music, those sounds are fairly straightforward. You know, a violin sounds like a violin and a French horn sounds like a French horn. But in Deadlands and then in the dungeons as well, I took the liberty of doing things like taking string section recordings and treating them as sound design source. In the overworld, there's a soprano singing. When you get into the underworld, you know, I can grab, even sometimes grab that same source. Like, let me take that song that she was singing up there and then I'm gonna take it down here and just destroy it. I'm gonna do all this stuff to it. But they've been badly burned and uh, mixed back in. It's almost metal. And uh, that kind of tone and that kind of feel and vibe carries all the way throughout. You can feel those heavy undertones of Mayrune's Dagon and his influence. Super happy with how Mayrune's came out. The first couple of times we saw people play through a main quest and hit those first couple of moments where you get to get a glimpse of Mayrun, then you hear his voice. Ooh, Daddy Dagon! His model is so cool and he's huge. It's absolutely enormous. Look at that big boy. Swinging that axe. When you watch the Twitch streams and they're like, holy crap, look at that. He's huge, you know? <laughs> so it definitely gets us excited and motivated and uh, Everything we do is, is for the fans. I love to see people take on the challenges and figure out the, the puzzles that we throw at them. Yes! Achievement! 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 Oh! Jesus! I don't know how I survived that. I don't know how I survived that, but I did. Really makes it all worth it is just seeing the fans like reacting to a character or a line that you didn't think anybody would notice. They're really supportive. They create some of the most amazing fan art of any community I've ever seen. Dagon looms large over the Elder Scrolls universe, and so we wanted to make sure that we were paying off that lineage. We weren't just cradling this flame, we were feeding it, stoking it, and making it burn brighter something that could be passed on to other installments of the Elder Scrolls. I think anyone who is creative always gets excited when they get to see something come to life.